Okay. Do we have everybody here? Any stragglers? Seniors? We're getting started with the Agile lecture. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it's 6.45. I know you guys have been straining your brain all day, uh, but hang in there because what you're going to learn over the next 45 minutes or so is going to be super valuable for you career-wise um, when you flap your wings and, and fly out of full stack uh, and, get, and not only interview for your first developer job, uh, but, but get it. And so you'll be able to hit, hit the ground running. W was anybody here last night for the alumni panel? And you probably heard probably all of the panelists say how important it was for them to understand Agile in terms of getting interviews, doing well in interviews, and then starting the actual job. Uh, and that's true. And so that's what we're going to be learning uh, during this lecture. Now, before we get started, <coughs> has anyone worked on an Agile team before? A couple takers. OK. Do we have any brave souls who want to take a stab at describing what Agile is? OK, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> that, was, that was great. <clears throat> uh, OK, last question. Uh, who can tell me why it's so important to learn Agile? Yeah. 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 I, I, I'd phrase it another way. There's about a 100% chance you'll be using it in your, in your next job some way, somehow. OK. Uh, so here's what we're going to be talking about over the next few minutes. <clears throat> Uh, first, we're going to talk about life before Agile. There was something called Waterfall. There still is. Um, back in the 1990s. I think that was like 800 years ago in internet time. I'm going to describe what that was um, and how that evolved into Agile. And we're going to talk specifically about two different types of Agile. Uh, Scrum and something called Kanban. Uh, and then we're going we're to uh, show a real world example of how we use uh, Agile here at Full Stack. OK, so life before Agile, Waterfall. Has anybody heard of Waterfall? Yeah? You want to walk us through what it is? <laughs> um, sure. Uh, basically, I kind of only know of it in like, contrast with Agile, but it's essentially um, you, do, you basically build the product and then release it, as opposed to iteratively building and then yeah, keyword is iterate. You yeah. really don't iterate when you're using Waterfall. Um, and in fact, you'll have to excuse this lame graphic. Waterfall is so old that this is the best graphic I could find on Google for it. I guess that's water flowing from one to the other. But basically, the idea is you do your analysis, your design, your implementation. So you write the code, uh, testing, deployment, and then maintenance. And this used to be the most popular way of, of writing software. But let me ask you, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. When you get to a certain point, so you can get yourself into a corner, and then if you upgrade your thing, you need to like start from the beginning again, kind of like get rid of the whole things so you can reuse them. Absolutely, it's backtrack is is a great word. You can't do it. It's sequential. It's not easy to go back as, as you learn new things and go through the building process. It's it's not easy to go back. You also have to plan everything at the start, right? So uh, requirements can't change during the process. So what if this thing that you're building is going to take you a year to build. That's a long slog if you can't change, uh, if you can't do any course correction. If, if one phase is delayed, then everything is. And actually, Waterfall is, is still used. Right? You're still going to find some companies who use it. Uh, what I would, how I would summarize Waterfall is it's OK for small projects 
like two weeks, a month, something like that. Some big companies still use it for big projects. Um, but definitely don't recommend it these days when there's other better methods for, for software development. So let's segue into Scrum, what Scrum is. Uh, and what I want to do is give you a sort of a bird's eye view picture of how Scrum works, and we'll, and we'll start from there. There's a, there's a lot going on in this picture, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. Let's begin in the top left-hand corner. Um, you get inputs from your executives, your stakeholders, whoever it is. Key people, I would say, there are your customers and your users. What do the users want in the product that you're building? Uh, you know, as they're sitting around going, gee, wouldn't it be great if your app did this or did that? You collect, th there's a product owner who's responsible for collecting all of that uh, information and putting it into a backlog, which is just a list of to-dos. And the backlog is organized such that the most important, the most commonly requested features, for example, are at the top of the backlog. Now, this is another graphic I found on the web. This, not an impressive sentence, but we'll try and make sense of it. Team selects starting at top as much as it can commit to deliver by end of sprint. Okay, I think what they're trying to say there is, at the beginning of every sprint, you take the, some of your tasks off of the top of the backlog and you figure out which ones you're going to do in the next uh, sprint. You break them out. And then you do your sprint planning, which I'll describe in a few minutes. Then you begin the sprint. Now it says here one to four weeks. Uh, who knows how, how long the average most common sprint is? No takers? Yeah, two, two weeks. Yeah, one week, you're going to be spending your whole life doing sprint planning and not writing code. Four weeks gets kind of long. Two weeks is almost always how long you hear of a, of a sprint lasting. Um, as you go through the sprint every day, there's a, they call it here a daily scrum meeting, more commonly known as a stand-up. And at the end of the sprint, you have finished work. Um, whatever was in the backlog is done, presumably. And then you do a sprint retrospective, which I'll talk about, and a sprint review. Uh, some people would, would call these demos. And I'll talk more about that uh, as well. So that's sort of the, bir the bird's eye view of how the Scrum workflow looks. But, so let's dive in a little bit in terms of the various team members. So first, you've got your team, your engineering team, you guys. right? So oftentimes, you'll see engineering teams are, are broken up, uh, are sort of divided um, front end and back end. It's a really common way that teams get separated. You guys are almost about to be full stack developers. You're a rare breed. You could go on either of those teams, but front end and back end is, is really common. And you have your product owner, okay? Product owner represents the end customer um, and, and is responsible for filtering all of those requirements that come in uh, and, and working closely with the uh, team. They own the backlog. They create the items and prioritize them, figure out which ones go at the top. They're responsible for maximizing the value of the product. That's a really important concept. Um, and ensuring that the right work is done, not only the right work is done, but it's done at the right time. They own the release management, what comes out uh, and when, and they do budgeting uh, around that. And they work closely with and basically manage the Scrum team. Now there's also a Scrum Master. The Scrum Master is the person who makes sure the, the Scrum team is following the best practices according to the agile powers uh, that be. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, it's usually not a full-time role. So you're not going to see somebody handing out a business card that says Scrum Master on it. Right? It's usually uh, something, a task that somebody takes on as part of their, over, their, their, their job. What, maybe they're a product manager or maybe they're a, a technical lead, whatever it may be. But somebody wears the hat of, of Scrum Master. They work as a servant leader for the team. And I think this is a great... Uh, concept. Usually the Scrum Master is not managing the engineers directly. You guys will probably be working into a CTO or a technical lead or whoever that is. You're not managed by the Scrum Master. So there's a great concept of, of servant leader. The, the Scrum Master is really there to kind of serve you guys, to serve the engineers and to make your life easier. Because it's ultimately in his or her interest. Uh, if, if your life is easier, you're going to be more, more productive. Right? Uh, and to that point, they, they guard the team the engineers from external disruptions. Who's familiar with the concept of context switching? A few of you, okay. That's a really important concept um, to keep in mind. And context switching, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is basically 
you know, say you're, you're heads down working on some really, you know, you're going beautiful mind on some piece of code, right? And then somebody taps you on your shoulder and goes, hey, can you work on this other thing? And it's like, well, but I'm in the zone here. When you keep on getting distracted like that, that costs, that, that, that's expensive in terms of your time, in terms of your mental bandwidth, and that's context switching. And a good product manager or scrum master will try and protect the engineers from context switching as much as possible. So you can focus on one thing from beginning to end. Maximizing the productivity of the team, removing impediments, you know, if there's a blocker, if there's an API that you're working with and you need some endpoints and you can't get it, you know, you go to your scrum master and say, hey, this is a blocker for me, continuing work on this. And they run the scrum events. So if you look at the product owner and the scrum master, here's a question. Should the scrum master and the product owner be the same person? Who thinks it should be the same person? Who think? It depends. It could be the product manager. It could be the CEO. It, it depends on the size of the company. I'm not sure if they should be the same person, but I like, feel like they're usually the same person. I feel like they're usually the same person. Yeah. Have you ever worked in a startup? Not a startup. Okay. Like, Right. All right. These are all good answers. And, and the answer I would give to this question is it depends. Right? If, if you're working in a large company with thousands of people, then yeah, you're probably going to want to have these roles separated because there are checks and balances uh, that are helpful in that type of environment. But if you're working in a startup with 10 people, um, that just doesn't make sense. Right? And, and for me, I've, I've done a few startups, um, and I always like to be the product owner and the scrum master because I like to be working directly with the engineers and, and the developers, sort of all of us, you know, sleeves rolled up, rather than have to go through, through someone. So it just depends. Um, and more often than not, if, if you guys go to work for a startup after this, um, it'll probably be the same person. Okay, so let's look at the backlog. Like I said before, this is just a list of features that we need to build, right? And, and you can see they're, they're phrased in a particular type of syntax there. These are just some random uh, examples. I'm going to go into the syntax in, in, in the next slide. But let me give you some characteristics of the backlog. All entries add value for the customer. If it doesn't, don't put it in the backlog. Real simple. The highest priority items are at the top, like we talked about. The level of detail depends on the entry position of each item. So what you're going to see and I'm going to show you this. When you click on to one of these <coughs> items, there'll be some supporting information in there. And you'll want to have more information for items that are at the top of the backlog, you know, ready to be worked on, rather than at the bottom. And it's a living document. Right? The backlog changes every day. In fact, the backlog usually changes all day, every day. It's constantly changing. OK, so each item in the backlog is what's called a, a user story. And they're phrased like this, as a blank, I want blank, so that blank. This is kind of the, the standard syntax. So for example, as a customer, I want to see the catalog of saleable items so that I can order one of them. Very basic standard syntax. But here's a question. Do you guys think that scrum teams really use this precise format for items in the backlog? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Yeah, good answer. Um, I'd say you're, you're going to see it every once in a while in this exact format. I very rarely see the so that, uh, but often you'll see the as a blank, I want blank. Um, so definitely be familiar with that language, that, that, that syntax. Um, but don't be surprised if uh, it, the user story is not written in that particular way. Now, yeah? Should it be written that way? Eh, you know, that, that's one thing about Agile. You know, you should, you know, whatever dev team you're on should customize it to what works best for you. Sometimes it makes sense to write it that way. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just, you know, creating a, you know, a, a new promise. You know, you're going to write a, a, a user story for creating a, something so heavily engineering related. You know, it, it just depends. Okay, so for each uh, user story, 
there's a set of instructions on that user story as to what needs to happen. And these are called acceptance criteria. And this is such a commonly used phrase that here on our engineering team, for example, we just call them AC. And we put them in an ordered list. So each ticket user story, AKA ticket or AKA issue, I prefer calling them tickets because issue to me implies something's wrong. Uh, but so each user story has acceptance criteria and it'll be like AC number one, AC number two, and so on. For example, as a logged on user, I expect to be able to see my account settings, whatever those specific instructions are. So once you got your user story and your acceptance criteria, then you're ready to start wireframing, wireframing out the feature. And there's different apps that people use. Does anybody recognize this app? Well, not, not what's actually being oh. designed, but the, the tool. <laughs> Nobody recognizes the tool? Balsamic, yeah. Balsamic is a really common uh, wireframing tool. It's balsamic, I think, dot com. Uh, balsamic with a Q on the end, really, really commonly used tool. And basically, for wireframes, I don't care what, what people use. They can sketch it out on a whiteboard and take a picture of it, piece of paper with a marker, as long as it conveys you know, what's supposed to be happening with this feature. There are some other tools uh, that you may see being used, Visio, InDesign, Cliffy.com, Wireframe.cc. Balsamic is probably the most commonly used one that you'll hear about. Or, you know, we really literally do things on whiteboards and take a picture of it. Okay, so once you've got your wireframes, you're ready to do your mocks, which are just basically higher resolution wireframes. And there's a couple different apps that, that uh, you'll see used. Photoshop, obviously, uh, Keynote. And Keynote is actually really good, I think, for, for mocks. Anybody know why Keynote is good for mocks? Because you can animate stuff really easily. And you can sort of simulate the user experience uh, in Keynote. And most people know how to use Keynote or PowerPoint, but Keynote more commonly. But there are a couple new tools that, in the last 12 months or so, we're starting to see more and more. One is called Sketch. Anybody know Sketch? A few of you. And do you use it? Do you like it? It's great, right? Yeah. $99. Um, it's, a, it's a UI, UX design tool. They're taking on Photoshop. It's this tiny little software company in like Norway or something with like 10 developers. Uh, but great product. We use it here. Um, really intuitive, good for creating uh, mocks. And there's also something I think that's coming out this year. Anybody heard of Project Comet? It's Adobe. Um, it's a new. Uh, user experience design tool that they're coming out with to compete with Sketch because Sketch is now doing so well. Adobe wants to get in on that action. There's a public beta coming out. I'm, I'm not sure how long. Uh, sometime this year. I'm not sure if, when, when it's coming out. Okay, so you got your mocks done and you're ready to move into the sprint planning phase. So each user story is estimated with story points like you said in the back there. Um, and I'm going to put up a series of numbers here. Who recognizes this series of numbers? Yeah. Um, Fibonacci. Fibonacci. Yeah. Good. Technically, it's modified Fibonacci. But uh, yeah, it's Fibonacci. And this is the sequence of numbers that are generally used for scrum teams to estimate story points, estimate the amount of work that's required to finish a ticket. <clears throat> And basically, the way Agile people say it should be done is, like for example, one is not one hour. They specifically say, don't set the number equal to a specific amount of time. They say, set it equal to a small task, like whatever you set it to. So for example, one may be building a small modal, or whatever you, however you assign that. I don't get that at all. That just makes things more complicated, less intuitive uh, to me. Uh, here, um, well, in, in my experience, different startups, we just set one story point equal to one hour. Now, the challenge is in estimating tasks, right? Like how long will it take to build a specific feature? And there's something that teams will sometimes use. Um, has anybody heard of something called planning poker? No? All right, well, we're going to play around a bit. So you guys are about to become experts in how to play planning poker. Can I get four volunteers to 
come up here. Yeah, come on up, come on up, yeah. And I'm going to put a task up on the screen. First of all, I'm going to give you each your Fibonacci's. All right. All okay. in. All in? Wow, you're going big. Before you even the idea like, that you can, like, it's Fibonacci because it like, makes it easier for people to actually estimate when the numbers are like this. Uh, yeah, the reason here, why don't you guys step to the side so everybody can see the screen. The reason people use Fibonacci, because you can see the, the, the delta between the numbers gets bigger as they get bigger. And the reason for that is it's the bigger the task, the more difficult it is to estimate the time required for that given task, right? So the way planning, po yeah. So infinity, is that just like this will never, ever happen? And why is it on the board? Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. OK, so the way planning poker works is I'll put some acceptance criteria up on the, on the board. You guys will read it, and you will each think about how many story points. Remember, in this case, one story point is one hour. And, if you, and you're going to hold your card, and you're all going to show your card at the same time. If you all come up with the same answer, we're done. That's our estimate. But if you don't, then I'm going to ask whoever came up with the highest number and the lowest number to explain yourselves. And then we'll do another round. And that's basically how, how planning poker goes. We're only going to do one round of this. A lot of, there's a lot of pressure. <laughs> you guys sure you're, you can handle this? All right, let's do it. We're building a new web app. Acceptance criteria. As a user, I want to be able to log in using a simple login page so that I can get started quickly. I should be playing the Jeopardy theme song at this point. Looks like you're ready. Yeah, looks like you're ready. You ready? All right, let's see them. Five, five, one, one half. OK, so why don't you explain it, and then I'll ask you to explain it. One half. It's an FSG. It's an FSG. <laughs> OK. All right, it's an FSG. Oh, yeah, I mean, the idea was like, I wasn't thinking of FSG, but I was thinking, like, whatever this web app is, like, the login is important, but I feel like for the proof of concept of whatever you're working on, login might not be, like, the most immediate thing. But I still rate it. I was, like, given out of, like, up to 100, like, what would I rate it as? I didn't want to put it as a 0 or a 1. Right. OK. Is so. the rating importance the time? The hour. It's hour time, right? You said hour. Is it hour? Yeah, one story point is equal to one hour. So you think that's going to take you five hours? Oh. It's too late. You're in too deep. You're in too deep. Okay. You made the same decision I made. I would like to point that out. All right. It's, get, it's getting ugly in here. Okay. I will remind you guys that in your deck you have one of these. Question mark. It was a trick question. You don't have enough information. There's too much uncertainty for you to precisely estimate that task. That's just a very vague acceptance criteria. And the, the point here is ask questions, right? If you don't know, don't estimate it. You know, keep drilling. And, and it's even OK to say, why? Why? I mean, don't be a jerk about it. You know, be nice about it. But it's OK to say why and ask questions until you know exactly what needs to be built, whether it's an FSG or, or something else. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, has anybody heard of the word velocity with respect to agile development? You're going to be hearing about it. Okay, velocity is basically, think of it this way. If, if you're working full-time as an engineer on a, on a back-end development team, you're working 40 hours a week, and let's say 10 of those hours you're doing random stuff, but 30 hours you're doing engineering work, then your velocity that week is 30, right? 30 story points, but 30. And if there's a dev team and it's got 10 developers on it, then the velocity for that team is 300 points per week, right? So velocity is a metric that's really uh, important for agile development uh, per sprint, not only for each developer, uh, but for each team. 
And uh, oftentimes, you know, this is a, a sneaky little trick that sometimes product managers will do, which is they'll track your velocity, but they won't tell you they're tracking your velocity. But you should be tracking your velocity, and you know, because you'll be estimating your points. Uh, and then when the task is completed, you'll know how many points you actually did on that task. And you should have a good sense for what your velocity, what your completed velocity was for each sprint. The point, yeah, so the point of planning poker, first of all, I very rarely use planning poker. I use it only for really big and complex tasks. And the reason people use it is because estimating can, by its very nature, be politically charged, right? So the project manager may say, that's only going to take you 10 hours. But you as the engineer may want to say, hey, it's going to take me 100 hours. So people have different motivations. Um, and maybe they just want to be accurate, but maybe they have an ulterior motive for whatever reason. But when you do planning poker, it's just a, a tool to sort of take all those political uh, agendas out of the equation. It's completely transparent, and everybody kind of has to agree. That's why people use planning poker. Yeah, in, in the real world, we would have done another round. Right, we would have kept going. People would have tried to convince each other of their estimates, and then we do another round. Yeah. Yeah. Just to clarify, is velocity the number of points that you're actually, that you pick, or is it just the difference between what you did actually and what you actually did? Uh, let's say in a given sprint, you're doing three tickets okay. that each have 10 story points on them. Okay. Then you're doing 30 story points. Your velocity is 30, okay. projected for that sprint. Yeah. OK. Now, as you go through the sprint, uh, there's daily stand-ups. You've probably seen them happening here. They happen every day at 12.50, um, where people just get up and stand up, usually in front of a, a scrum board. I'll show you a couple examples of those. Uh, you try to keep the stand-up as quick as possible. Everybody's busy. And you just go around the room. Talk, people say what they worked on yesterday, uh, what they're working on today, and if there's any blockers, anything they need to continue working on whatever they're working on. There's also something called a social contract. And I used one of these in one of my startups once. It was pretty funny. Uh, but basically, it's, you, know, you can use them for, you know, on the Scrum team, you specify, hey, we're all in this together. Um, and let's, we all need to be able to count on each other. So for example, we had a social contract on one of my Scrum teams where if you were late to stand up, you had to buy Starbucks for everybody. Um, so latte is for everybody, and it's on you if you're late to, to stand up. I guess these guys. If you're late, you have to wear a, a tote bag of shame saying, saying you're late. But social contract can be sort of a fun way uh, that people use um, to, so everybody sort of is, is rowing in the same direction and, and being able to count on each other. There's another concept in, in Agile, which is the fact that it's important to define what done is for any given task. Uh, and, and so, for example, you may define done uh, for a backlog item, whether it's writing the code or doing documentation, running tests, uh, if you're doing test-driven development, for example. Uh, for a sprint, it may be installing a demo. Or for a release, it may be writing release notes. But there should be a shared understanding of what it means to be done with a particular task or, or some sort of release. OK, there's also something called a burndown chart, which is pretty common in Agile development. And if there's sort of one dashboard view that people rely on, it's probably this one. Um, and I'll give you a, an extreme example. Um, in a previous life, I did quite a bit of work with NBC. They have a facility in Secaucus, New Jersey, I think it is. I spent a bunch of time over there. Their development team, there's different rooms. And in each room, there's a flat screen TV on, on the wall with a live burndown chart. And basically, what a burndown chart is, is you can see uh, on the y-axis, it's story points. And on the x-axis, these are each, each day of the sprint. So you probably can't see it in the back of the room, but it's April 23 to May 6. So that's a two-week sprint, 60 points, at the, or 50 whatever points. And this gray line is, on average, how many story points should be completed as you work through the sprint. right? Um, but basically, when you complete a ticket and it gets deployed or, or whatever, whatever done is, then those story points are done. And that's what's represented by the red line, how many points are left to do. And the red line should roughly track 
the gray line. And if it doesn't, then everybody can see, hey, we're not on track to finish this sprint on time. Now, this can be good news, bad news for, for engineers, right? I prefer to think of it as good news because if you're, you know, doing well on your sprint and you're completing your tickets and people are coming in and trying to disrupt you and ask you how are things going and you can just say, pretty good, just look at the burn down chart, that's a real short conversation. So this can be a really powerful tool um, to just communicate really quickly so you don't have to spend time in cycles explaining uh, and justifying, just keep the burn down chart uh, looking good. Then at the end of the sprint, there's sprint demos. And this is kind of like, I, I actually really love sprint demos. I think of it as like show and tell in third grade. Everybody gets to show, all the engineers get to stand up and show what they built. And say, I'm so awesome. You see this? You see what I built? Um, basically show off. Uh, but also, um, it's a great way to keep everybody synced up in terms of the various things that are being built on whatever product uh, you're working on. And then there's sprint retrospectives which is where the team, the scrum master and the engineers will get together uh, and talk about um, what they think went well during the sprint, what didn't, and what improvements could get made um, in the next sprint. So here's a question. Do you think scrum teams actually do, in the real world, retrospectives? Yeah. If they actually iterate, I think it would be ridiculous not to. Ridiculous not to. Sometimes they happen, right? More often than not, in my experience, they don't. Be, especially if, if you're like introducing a new workflow, something new about the workflow, then you want to get together and say, hey, how's it going? You, are we liking this workflow? Then a retrospective makes a lot of sense. But if it's just business as usual and everybody's kind of running and gunning, retrospectives are not so necessary. So in the real, real world, what I've seen, you, you would think, I would agree with you, theoretically, yeah, you do one every time. But I've just found that uh, they rarely happen actually, in my experience. Not necessarily that that's a good thing. <clears throat> okay, that's some of the theory about Agile. Now let's get into the specific tools uh, that people are using. And the first one is called Jira Agile. Who's heard of Jira Agile? Nobody. Wow. Um, have you heard of a company called Atlassian? A couple of you. All right, Atlassian makes Jira Agile. Um, Atlassian did an IPO about a month ago. They raised $500 million at a $5 billion valuation. So I guess that makes them a quote unquote unicorn. They kind of own this space um, in terms of Agile software. You will probably be using Jira Agile. Um, I don't think that's a good thing, sadly. Um, I am not a fan of Jira Agile. Um, I think it's super bloated. Um, and there are a lot of things in there that you just simply don't need and that really get in the way. Atlassian has a suite of products. Jira Agile is one of them. They've also got HipChat, which is like Slack, and they've got something called Bitbucket, which is like GitHub, but not as good. Um, and so they kludge all these products together and they make you work with these products, but it's just, it, for me, I think of Jira Agile as like Internet Explorer. It's just like, it's not Chrome, you know what I mean? It's just not, but, it's used by most dev teams. There's another one called Pivotal Tracker. I, if I had to put a number on it, I'd say maybe 20% of dev teams out there use this tool. Uh, I don't know anything about it. Never used it. it looks like a scrum boardy type of thing, but I can't give you an opinion, but just so you know the name of it. Then the next couple apps are really kind of just GUIs on top of GitHub. One is called zenhub.io which basically creates a scrum board uh, out of your tickets on GitHub. You guys are using GitHub now, obviously, right? From day one, I guess, you're using GitHub. Okay. Um, and there's another one called Waffle. And most people that you talk to in the industry in New York City, for example, probably haven't heard of Waffle. It's new. It's a little guy. It's a little competitor. Came out of, it was like a, some interns built it at a company called Rally Software. Um, but that's actually what we use. We really like Waffle. It's super lightweight. Um, it's just, it takes your GitHub repo and it puts a, a Scrum Agile uh, UI on top of it. And I'm gonna show you uh, Waffle. I'm gonna show you our Scrum board, what it looks like. 
OK, there are a couple organizations. One is called Scrum Alliance. One is called the International Scrum Institute. And they can certify you in Scrum. So you could spend $1,000 and a weekend and get a Scrum certification. Who thinks this is a good idea? You know people who do it. Right. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not pretty, is it? It's not too impressive. Okay, here's how I would answer this question. Don't do this. Right? Especially don't spend your money to do this. If you get a job and your company wants to pay you to get certified, fine. But in about five minutes from now, you'll be done learning everything you need to know about Scrum. All right, don't do this. OK, so that's Scrum, how Scrum works. Let's look at Kanban. OK, so if you think of Scrum as being time bound in sprints, Kanban is, is very similar, except it's not time bound. Just think of it as like a like an ongoing assembly line of tickets. There's no sprints. There's still a backlog. Um, there's still a scrum board, but they call it a Kanban board. But there's no sprints. There's no sprint planning. There are no story points. There are no daily stand-ups, usually. No demos. And no retrospectives. It's just an ongoing assembly line. Now, I know when we began this talk, I said there are two types of agile workflows. But there's actually three. And it's a hybrid of Scrum and Kanban. And you can probably guess what it's called. Scrum Kanban. Scrumban. Yeah. And it's sort of a hybrid, where you've got your backlog, you've got your Scrum board. Everybody calls it a Scrum board. Nobody calls it a Kanban board. Um, you don't have your sprints or your sprint planning or, or your story points, but you do do stand-ups. You do do demos, uh, and you do do retrospectives. And at the end of this, the talk, I'm going to give you a link to an article about Scrumban. Um, we're starting to see more and more people use this type of approach. OK, so that's how Agile works. Scrum, Kanban, and Scrumban. So let's look at a, a real world example and what we do here at Full Stack. OK. We've got an engineering team here. It's called the Full Stack Engineering Team. And we use Scrumban. That's a very recent development, um, as of about three weeks ago. We were using Scrum for a long time. Uh, but what we found is that the overhead, the time required, and the energy required for sprint planning was super intense. Right? Plus, it's difficult to estimate tasks. It's hard for engineers, right? Because how do you estimate a task before all the acceptance criteria are done, before the mocks are done? You, you can really only estimate a task once it's done, right? Because you never know what's going to pop up. So it's frustrating for engineers. It's frustrating for product managers. Estimates are always all over the map. And it takes a lot of time and energy. It also takes a lot of time and energy to do sprint planning. You know, we used to do sprint planning every Friday. We'd have a full day of meetings. Uh, the, the engineers would actually put together their own proposed sprints. We'd review them. We'd approve them, and then they'd get started on them on Monday. But that puts a lot, that's a lot of extra work when people are not writing code. That's the fun part, right? Writing code. Um, so what we decided to do is do a test to test out Scrumbon. Um, and it's been working really, really well for us. Now, I will say that it's probably pretty unlikely that when you get out there, you'll be using Scrumbon. You'll probably use Scrum. But just know that it's an alternative. And in some situations, it works really well, like ours. OK, so our team is set up like this. Uh, we've got our stakeholders up here, primarily students, you guys, right? We've got our business owners, David and Nimit, and they feed inputs into uh, the team. So I serve the, the role of the product owner and the product manager. Um, Otter, who came through full stack, I don't know if you guys have met Otter. Some of you probably have. He's our creative director, unbelievable designer. Zeke is, used to be an instructor here. 
Now he's our lead engineer. And we've got two full-time uh, senior engineers. Well, Ayana is now teaching at Grace Hopper for this semester, but you may know Ayana. Really talented. Came out of Stanford, came out of Princeton. Super sharp group of people. Uh, and we also have um, senior fellows and junior fellows um, who I think Nimit just gave you the talk about the fellowship program. So you probably have a pretty good sense for uh, what they do on the engineering team. It's actually really good um, exposure to a real world engineering environment. This is our scrum board. And I'm going to show you how we have it set up. OK. I'm going to zoom way out here. You're not going to be able to read anything at, at this perspective. But you can see there's a lot of swim lanes going on here. Each column is called a swim lane. And I'm going to walk you through why we have so many swim lanes. Let me zoom back in. OK, there's an inbox here. Basically, tickets come in here, and they work their way across the board until they're done, and then they get archived off the board. Uh, whenever we create a new issue, if somebody has a new idea, they put it into GitHub, and it shows, uh, it shows up here in the inbox. Then I'll take a look at it. Um, I'll review it. And if it's something we've already done, it's a duplicate, it's invalid, then we'll get the ticket out of the backlog. More likely, it'll go into our backlog. And you probably won't be able to read these unless you go like that. But one of the cool things about, that I really like about Waffle is each one of these swim lanes you can collapse. And <clears throat> so there's actually a lot of tickets in each of these. And the way we have our engineering team set up, as you can see, this one says internal backlog, and then a category, internal backlog, a bunch of these, and then external backlog. And that's just a way we, we uh, divide things up. Internal means the tools um, that you guys are using, for example, in the senior phase on LearnDot. And external is, I think you know, we've, we've just launched our first online course, JavaScript Jumpstart. I'm not sure if you know that, actually. Uh, it's in alpha right now. Um, so we're starting to build some online-only uh, products. Uh, bugs. You may have noticed in LearnDot that at the bottom of the screen, there's a button that says Report a Bug. Please do that. You're our best friend when you report bugs. Um, bugs go into here. Uh, that, when, you when you file that, when you, when you fill that Press that button, fill it in. It creates a GitHub ticket. It goes onto the board, and we work through it. Um, then we've got a swim lane here. Jumpstart alpha changes. So we're in alpha. The alpha version of this release, the beta version, comes out uh, a week from today. And so this is a bunch of tickets we want to get done in the next uh, week. So we put a swim lane together for that. Up next, internal. And up next, external. This is just like. If you watch baseball, this is like on deck, being on deck uh, for uh, tickets. Then once we decide we want to uh, actually build one of these uh, user stories, uh, it goes in, it gets dragged into the design mocks swim lane. Uh, Otter uh, will nine times out of 10 design the mocks. Then he'll drag it into, it, it'll get assigned to an engineer. We'll drag it into the right engineering notes swim lane. And that's where we have the engineer just write a few bullet points about how they're going to attack this problem um, so we can have a shared understanding of the best way uh, to write the code. Then there's a swim lane for write code internal, write code external. Once it's done, the engineer will drag the ticket into InDesign review. Otter will take a look at it. Um, then uh, if he approves it, it'll come into product review. I'll take a look at it. If it meets all of the acceptance criteria, then I'll move it into code review. I think Nimit was talking earlier about Zeke, how he's tough in, in code review. That's a good thing. So I'll drag it into code review. Once it gets through code review, um, it gets deployed. If it, gets, if it passes all those reviews, it gets deployed. We, we deploy code um, several times a day. And actually, one thing that you'll notice is, for example, this ticket has another ticket attached to it. So this is the GitHub ticket number. This is the pull request. You can see it's green, so it passes all the tests. And basically, for the pull request, if you, in the title, you call the pull request, quote unquote, closes, and then the ticket number that it's closing, then that pull request will be attached to the ticket on the scrum board. And that's how things get uh, pushed down the line. Then once it's deployed, um, it gets archived off the board. So this is our scrum board for our scrum bond workflow. And what we actually thought is that when we move to this type of a workflow, that we were going to be moving more slowly 
because we weren't, we, weren't, we weren't putting the emphasis on rush, rush, rush with sprints. That was our theory. What we actually found is we started to move more quickly. And that was really counterintuitive. Um, but what we found is it was really good for context switching because the engineers didn't need to pick like three or four tickets. They were just focusing on one ticket at a time. And then uh, when their, their ticket was all done, then they'd sort of raise their hand digitally uh, and say, I'm ready for another ticket. Um, and so it just turned out to be a really uh, smooth way to run the, uh, to run the workflow. Okay, so that's our scrum board. Yeah? So in that case, are you always assigning the next ticket, or can they pick from the list of outstanding? Uh, they can request. Like, you know, sometimes engineers, like John Pedigo, who you, some of you guys know, he's been doing a lot of our YouTube-related tickets. Karen has been doing a lot of our permissioning tickets. So it just depends. People focus on certain areas. They can certainly request if there's like an area they want to learn or they're really into. Um, the way we have it set up is uh, Griffin assigns tickets. We've got two squads. Griffin assigns tickets to the internal squad, and Zeke assigns tickets to the external squad. OK. How we run our Agile team? Uh, daily stand-ups. Try to keep them 10 minutes max. Engineering demos every other Friday. We actually videotape them on the rig back there. Um, and the reason we do that is so you know if Nimit or whoever cannot be here, then they can just watch the uh, on-demand replay of the demos. I love demos. Uh, retrospectives, we are, this is a new workflow, so we're definitely doing retrospectives. Um, make sure it's, it's working for everybody, and people seem, the engineers especially, seem really happy about it. Everybody seems to be liking this. And like I said, no story points. There's literally no estimating. There's no poker planning. There's no estimating. OK. So we've covered all the topics in the talk. So I want to sum things up and give you guys a couple pieces of specific advice that, that may help out as, as you sort of dive deeper into this topic. First of all, simply, real world agile experience will be invaluable when you take your first job after full stack. You heard that from the alumni last night. And the fact is, employers will expect you to know agile. Even if they don't say it, they're going to grill you about it during your interviews. And they're going to expect you to, to know it you know, day one on the job. Because they're busy. right? They're trying to ship a product out the door. They want to know when they hire you that you can hit the ground running. You know sort of these different phrases and these different methods. And you can just get into, you know, hit the ground running um, with their team. So ergo, knowing Agile will make you a more attractive candidate as you're out there getting your your next job after full stack. So what I would recommend is, to the extent possible, get some Agile experience. Now, it's easy to say, harder to do, but I'm going to give you a couple specific things you can do. First of all, if, if you know, you, now you know what the Fellows Program is, if you're thinking about that, super strong way to get Agile um, experience. There's a video I recommend that you can see the title there. And by the way, I'm going to slack out these slides tomorrow. <coughs> so you'll have the, uh, the link to this. Um, this is, I think, the product manager for Jira Agile. And he gives an overview of how their tool works, how their platform works. Really good to know, even though I don't, I'm, not, I'm a Jira hater. Uh, but it's still good to know it. It's a great article. It just came out a couple weeks ago. You may have seen it on Hacker News. Um, you see the title here. Um, and the link is there. Uh, and this article articulates better than I can a dev team going from Scrum to Kanban, why they did it, and, and what they saw. So the thing about Agile, right, when you get out there and, and you're talking to employers, it's almost, like, it's almost like a sports team. Like everybody's got their favorite, right, and everybody's opinionated about it. There's no one specific right answer. Uh, but it's good to have an opinion, right, and this is a great article. Uh, to help strengthen your opinion that you've you already know some of the things now. Uh, there's also, actually, you'll see if you watch that video, the guy in that video gives a tip, which is run your life agile for a week. Don't do it now. You guys are busy. Don't do it now. Uh, but what he suggests, and I think this is a great idea, is whatever calendar time management system you're using, go cold turkey. Stop using it for a week and use Jira Agile to manage yourself personally. 
uh, your own schedule, your own time. You can get a free uh, one-week trial for Jira Agile. So it works well with that. Uh, so you're killing two birds with one stone. You're really reinforcing these concepts. You'll have them down cold in terms of Agile. Um, and you'll, you'll know Jira Agile by the end of that exercise. Another idea that I recommend is as you build your capstone project, run your team as an Agile team. Really good way to get some experience. So that's it. Questions? Yeah. Agile? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. The zero card is that basically meaning like this is a duplicate? We've already done this, and we should be focusing on it in the dot uh, Zero could mean more commonly like it's such a small task, like it's one line of code. I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to put a ticket in for it. Where do you get those cards? Am Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with the, the capstone project, how would you recommend like to just not have like a project, uh, the owner of the product, the project, all that, or should we divvy that up? Have, like, how would that happen? Uh, I wouldn't run it real strict, agile. I would just kind of get your feet wet with it. So, have you already set up your GitHub repos for your capstone projects? Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of you have. Some of you are about to. Um, so, take that GitHub repo. You can use Waffle. It's free. Uh, so just create a waffle scrum board, play around with the swim lanes. Um, I think you may have heard some of the teams who talked about their capstone projects probably said how they used a, a scrum board. Um, so just set up some very sp simple swim lanes like backlog, to do, to review, done, something like that. Um, and just get a feel for it. Use, you, but use waffle, it's free. Don't use, I definitely wouldn't recommend Jira Agile for capstone, but it's just too much of a learning curve for Agile, for Jira Agile. GitHub is just a visualization layer yeah. of your Git. Uh, I mean, Waffle is just a visualization of your GitHub repo. The issues, should start in GitHub. The issues live in GitHub. Okay. Yeah, they should start there. They. Oh, and here's here's another thing about GitHub in terms of your workflow. You guys are probably all really used to using Slack by now, right? So you would think when you're working on tickets, you send. If you're working on a particular ticket, you've got some comments back and forth. You post them in Slack. Don't do that. I recommend not doing that. Do it all your communication about a ticket in GitHub. At mention each other. Otherwise, if you, if you post you know, ticket-related comments in Slack, they're gone. Right? Once one, you know, Slack archives it for like a week or whatever it is. Uh, but you need a history, a threaded discussion about each topic so you, need, uh, so you can go back at any point and see why decisions, decisions were made. And that's why it's really important uh, to make all your comments in GitHub and at mention people. Any other questions? Okay, thanks guys.